Some days, the sun rises, bright and golden, seeping honey across honey-colored land. Some days, the red of Mordor. Some days, barely illuminated shades of gray as far as the eye can see. Some days, bright heat. Some days, soft warmth. Some days, it doesn't even touch us. Some days, nothing can touch us. We live in interesting times that will mark the forever, or at least for a good long time to come. Stories will be told. We wanted to make history, but not like this. Meanwhile, grass grows, squirrels scrabble at the window, chickadees and jays clamor for their supper. We marry or not, grow old or not, grow older in any case, die most surely. What? Then shall we choose in the meantime, how shall we be? In this moment, on this day, we are here. Come, let us worship together. So the next thing on our agenda is the wisdom for all ages. And this was my very favorite book when I was a kid. I have these memories of losing my Robin Hood hat in the in the haunted house maze made by the youth group in the Westport Unitarian Universalist Church when I was five years old. <laughs> so I knew the stories from an early, early age, and I read the Howard Pyle book, the one that I'll be paraphrasing, um, this morning for the first time when I was seven years old. So for me, these are, these are pivotal childhood stories. I've made free with the longness and the shortness of the thing, lest we be here well into the night. In merry England, in times of old, when good King Henry II ruled the land, there lived within the green glades of Sherwood Forest near Nottingham Town a famous outlaw whose name was Robin Hood. No archer ever lived that could speed a gray goose shaft with such skill and cunning as his, nor were there ever such yeomen as the seven score merry men that roamed with him through the greenwood shades. Right merrily they dwelt within the depths of Sherwood Forest, suffering neither care nor want, but passing time in merry games of archery or bouts of cudgel play, living upon the king's venison, washed down with draughts of ale of October brewing. Not only Robin himself, but all the band were outlaws and dwelled apart from other men, yet they were beloved by the country people round about. For no one ever came to Jolly Robin for help in time of need and went away again with an empty fist. Now there are many tales told and sung of our fine hero of how he was first made an outlaw by his own pride and skill, how he gathered many of his men, his battle with little John over the creek where fell his pride and his person into the water, how he outwitted the sheriff of Nottingham not once, not twice, but many times how he went to town as a butcher, as a tinker, how he bested everyone at archery for none had such skill, and how at last he came under the service of King Richard, for in his lifetime he knew two kings. But this is the story of Robin and Alan Adele, a minstrel. So one day, Robin was sitting around under the greenwood tree, and he sent his good men to find some rich burgher or wealthy nobleman to waylay that they might feast together in the forest until some of their guests' gold might line the coffers of the band, for this was the way of things in that time. But between sunup and sundown, not one rich burger could be found. As the men wended their way homeward, they heard not the clink of coins and wealth, but the notes of sorrow coming from a glade. So following the voice, they found a young, sweet-faced man, harp hung on the willow above his head, crying into the grass. They returned to the forest with this young man, and Robin, taking pity upon him, gently asked about his grief. His name was Alan Adele, and his tale, if you good people do not already know it, was that two days hence, his beloved was due to be married to a wealthy and old knight whom she did not love, and Alan's heart was like to break. Her father wanted her married well, and carried not a whit for her heart. Upon hearing this, Robin vowed to make things come aright, and he set about plotting and planning, for there wasn't much time. He found a vowed priest who cared not for bishop or abbot or the strong arm of the church. He gathered his men and his costumes, and on the day appointed for the wedding, they went and stationed themselves at and around the church to appear at the appropriate times. 
Robin, disguised as a harpist, for this was before the times of photographs and social media, and none quite knew what his face might truly be. Friar Tuck awaiting his moment in the choir loft, and others here and there among the crowd and gathered outside, more than a score of men in total spread through the space. By this and by that, the wedding was interrupted before it began, Robin playing the magical harpist, who would, in fact, make the bride and the groom love each other till death did them part. And Alan and Ellen were able to be duly married, with great joy for almost everyone, the bishop and Sir Stephen the Knight accepted, and her father, Edward of Deerwold, for whom, instead of joy, there were 200 gold coins from Robin's own purse. Now, this is more or less where the story ends, but there is one detail you should hear. When Sir Stephen, the old knight, knew what was afoot, with the girl's father standing by ready to force her hand, he said, Nay, fellow, thou mayest take thy daughter back again. I would not marry her after this day's doings, could I gain all merry England thereby. I tell thee plainly, I loved thy daughter and would have taken her up like a jewel from the sty. Yet truly, I knew not that she did love this fellow and was beloved by him. Maiden, if thou dost rather choose a beggarly minstrel than a high-born knight, take thy choice. I do feel it shame that I should stand thus talking, and so I will leave you. And he took his leave. Edward made as, to, as if to protest, but Robin turned to him and said, You have a choice. You may give your blessing to your daughter's marriage, and I will give you two hundred pieces of gold to smooth your way. Or you may give none. Your daughter will be married anyway, but not so much as a cracked farthing will cross your palm. Choose. And Edward, unwilling to let such a chance go by, said, Very well, then. I shall give my blessing. But he was not overly joyful about it. So we're glad that Alan and Ellen were married. We're glad that Friar Tuck was found and joined the band. The night left with empty hands, but her father's blessing cost 200 pieces of gold. Who then is noble? Here ends the story. Our reading today carries the words of Audre Lorde, a song for many movements. Nobody wants to die on the way and caught between ghosts of whiteness and the real water, none of us wanted to leave our bones on the way to salvation, three planets to the left a century of light years ago. Our spices are separate and particular, but our skins sing in complementary keys. At quarter to eight meantime, we were telling the same stories over and over and over. Broken-down gods survive in the crevasses and mud pots of every beleaguered city where it is obvious there are too many bodies to cart to the ovens or gallows. And our uses have become more important than our silence. After the fall, too many empty cases of blood to bury or burn. There will be no body left to listen. And our labor has become more important than our silence. Our labor has become more important than our silence. Good morning once again, and thank you so much for inviting me to join you. My name is Leela Sinha. My pronouns are Z and Zim. And before I preach, I like to do two things. One is tell you who I am, and two is give you a little warning. So let's start with who I am. I am a Unitarian Universalist entrepreneurial community minister. I live and work in the Bay Area, and I focus, I focus on the possibilities when pleasure intersects power. Power, pleasure, and ethics are my, are my zone. I have a very spoken word beat poetry inflected preaching style and sometimes it takes people by surprise so I've found that if you're not taken by surprise it works better. The words sometimes come very fast 
if they're coming too fast for you to catch all of them, that's okay. Just let the ones that you need soak in and the ones that you don't need will just wash over you like water over river stones. So, what does it mean to be noble? I've been asking this question for a while now in various ways, in part because I ran across a YouTube series of a woman who is renovating a chateau in France. She's British, but she bought a chateau in France. She's quite a long way into it now. I think she's been doing it for like 16 years, and the chateau is finally coming along nicely. She, like many renovators of old houses, was a little taken by surprise by the amount of time and paperwork and money involved in renovating a chateau. But what makes her different from a lot of people who are renovating big, fancy old houses is that she thinks of herself like old school nobility, by which I mean she thinks of herself as responsible for spreading resources and doing good. She's got like a Christmas present project and a charity project or two going elsewhere, and it's fairly impressive. She understands that having the responsibility of creating and maintaining this space, occupying such a large place in the village of which it is a part, of having such a tremendous resource, she understands that as conveying a certain amount of responsibility. I would argue that very few people these days who have the resources to do something like that understand that it comes with responsibility. And I think what we're missing there is the quality of nobility. What if we were noble? Or what if we even aspired to nobility? What would that even mean? To me, nobility is a combination of power and that sense of responsibility. I mean, maybe I should have even called this sermon the case for nobility and Unitarian Universalism, although that's fairly boring, because that's all good power is. If power is the ability to do something, nobility is the understanding that in order to have, that if you have power, you should be doing something good with it. If power is the ability to do something, nobility is the understanding that if you have power, you should be doing something good. And we've lost that. It's really visible in the changes in our hero movies and stories. There's this deterioration in popular media where in order to portray increasingly complex heroes, we've started to go to the villains. Recently, a lot of the new movies have been featuring villains just as themselves. It started way back with Wicked, but now there have been so many, especially under the Marvel Disney umbrella. Why? We could make a dystopian argument about manipulation of public expectations, and I don't think that's entirely wrong, but I think deep down it is much easier for us to believe that we are villains than heroes. Villainy comes with a kind of free pass, with a certain amount of liberty to do bad things, to make mistakes, and even choose vengeance or pettiness or cruelty to have a bad day over and over, to give in to the human impulses to lash out when we are harmed. Because after all, what is a villain if not somebody who does bad things? So you kind of have to, you know, make some mistakes and be slightly wrong and be mean, and if not outright evil, in order to continue to fill your role if you're supposed to be a villain. We like villains, we can relate to them because we feel like it's a bar we can hit. And so we've moved away from those other heroes, the hero heroes, who always try to do the right thing, who recognize their mistakes and own up to them and then avoid making other errors based on what they've learned. We've moved away from them to these complex, sympathetic villains. It's like all our faves were problematic, so we just decided we weren't going to have heroes anymore. I think that's a mistake. Even though everyone has bad days, makes deliberate bad choices sometimes, sometimes just messes up, gets too tired to do the right thing, I think giving up on heroes and heroic aspirations is a big mistake. The characters in our stories do not have to be exactly like us. The characters in our stories can be relatable, better versions of us, or straight up better than us. They can show us what's possible. They can give us something to live up to, to aspire to. Nobody is as good as a hero, but that doesn't mean it's not worth reaching for. It doesn't mean you can't reach some of it. Perhaps if we understood that reaching for unattainable goals is still useful, that not every goal needs to be a SMART goal, that's specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-oriented, 
The castles in the sky are okay, sometimes even if they don't have foundations under them, dear Thoreau. We would be more at ease with the people we look up to. We must remember also that historically we understood that someone we looked up to had a private side, a space and time where they were able to be a more flawed, more human human, and a public face that was a little bit of a show, and that was okay. Yes, if you go digging in the closet, you will find skeletons, so don't do that. The story of the hero is the thing that can guide us. That is who we want to be, and that is who we want to follow. It's okay to love what's possible in order to become more of who we want to be. Bernadette Banner, another YouTuber specializing in historical fashions and sewing, recently did a piece on expectations of photographs. There's this technology now called Facetune, which makes significant retouching of photographs for the internet possible. And recently there was a lot of fuss about it, you know, being lying on the internet. She starts out explaining that this kind of retouching, not just removing blemishes, but like narrowing waists, improving busts, and all the rest of it has been around since the dawn of photography and even before that, when what was true in the artist's studio was not necessarily what ended up on the canvas. And then she makes the interesting point that it is only our expectations that have changed, that we expect photographs now to show the whole incontrovertible truth and nothing but the truth, but that's a new expectation, that when photography first emerged for portraits, it was a technological update to painting and subject to the same expectations as painting was, that artists would use their art to make the subject look as good as possible, even if it wasn't entirely reality. And I think we can do the same thing for heroes. It's okay for us to not know every sordid backstory. They can have their privacy. And we can understand that whatever we see in public is to some extent a work of fiction. But it is a work of fiction that can guide us even if it is unattainably blemish-free. My childhood hero was Robin Hood. And nobody is that kind of archer. I watched a little bit of Olympic archery this year, and even gold medalists are not that good. He was supposed to have been almost flawless in archery, in judgment, a little luckier than you think he should be, and always willing to sacrifice himself or at least put himself on the line, always willing to put his actual body in the place. You never hear a story about Robin Hood having a bad day. Those aren't the stories that we pass down. There's only one story that I know of about him getting nearly killed, and that's before the story that he, in which he gets actually killed. There are a couple of close calls with the sheriff, but in general, he's larger than life. It makes it a good story. The story sinks into our bones with the biochemistry of awe and pleasure and joy, and that's how it should be. Because Robin Hood and other characters like him and the real life people that we really want to admire all are all meant to embody ideals and possibilities and the best of humanness so that we can believe in the best of humanness in ourselves. When we only tell stories about villains, no matter how redemptive, no matter how good an explanation for someone has for their terrible behavior, it was still terrible behavior. It still caused harm. And that's not what we're aiming for, or it shouldn't be. We don't need Disney to deconstruct the fairy godmother until she's the bad guy. We need to believe that somewhere out there is a fairy godmother whose job it is to run around doing good things for people all the time and who really enjoys it. We need to believe. And the reason we need to believe is because we need nobility to exist. We need to lift up and maintain human nobility. Nobility that's actually enacted by real human beings, not heroes, not fictitious characters, not ladies of the lake. We need humans to go out there and be human heroes and humanly noble. And we can only have humans be humanly noble if they know that they can do that. If we know we can do that. Because it's not those people over there somewhere who are responsible for being noble. It's us. It's us. We unspecial, deeply flawed, complicated humans. That's who's got to be noble. That's what makes nobility so remarkable and so important and so necessary is that it's not some magical creature doing it. It's us. But we need an example of what that might look like so that it can be us. And that is why we need those heroes. We need an example of what it might look like so that we can imagine that in this moment, in this snapshot, maybe not always and always for the rest of forever so that we go down in history and stories and songs are told about us hundreds of years from now, but right now, in this moment, we can be noble. 
we can also be villains. And that's the human part, is that when we dispose of nobility and we retain power, we become villains. I don't think it's wrong to think of these things dichotomously in individual moments, even if it's complicated in a larger view. I am the first person to talk about spectrums and shades of gray and shades of everything and four and five dimensional concepts of things that we tend to think of as two points in a line, like gender and even rightness and wrongness. But in a particular moment, in a slice of time, it's okay to understand that some things are good and some things are not. And our job is to do the goodest thing we can do. When I say slice of time, I saw a TikTok by creator Ben J. Handy recently that was brilliant, talking about the way that we understand time and how as three-dimensional beings looking at four-dimensional and at looking at time as a four-dimensional entity, it's all kind of like, it's like all of existence is an apple, but we can only see one slice of the apple at a time. All of time still exists, but we can only interact with one slice and then the next slice. And so when I think about the ways that we understand ourselves and our capacity to be things sustainably over time, sometimes I think about us as being in those slices, about this moment in time as a slice. The whole of time exists, but all we can perceive and interact with in the, is this one slice that's happening right now. And so it's okay to sometimes acknowledge that what we will do in this one slice will be or appear binary. In this one slice, it's okay to understand that some things are right and some things are wrong. And therefore, in this moment, that we could be good or we could be evil. In this moment, we can be noble or we can be corrupt. In this moment, we can be a hero or we can be a villain. It's just this moment, but it's all we've got. It's even okay to understand that in this moment, we can be something that we cannot sustain always and forever. Even in our humanness, we cannot sustain perfection or even goodness. And so we go in and out of it. And in this moment, we can be good. We can be noble. So if nobility is simply the understanding that when you have the power, you should be doing something good with it, that's very Unitarian Universalist. Not who we are necessarily, but who we want to be. So then the question is, what is stopping us Unitarian Universalists from doing that? What is keeping us from doing something good in each slice of time? Because I know we want to. One of the challenges is that we do not always perceive the other piece of the equation, our ability to do something good. We do not always perceive our power. And if we don't recognize our power, if we don't recognize that the table saw is turned on, then we don't know that we can shape the wood. And so we get in the habit of thinking that we can't. We give up not only on power itself, but also on nobility, on our ability to enact rightness in the world. Instead, we become the rebels. Now we come by it rightly. Unitarian Universalism comes out of a long series of rebellions, rebellions against church, rebellions against dogma, rebellions against particular kinds of theology. It's in our blood. It's in our bones. If you know systems theory, it's in our systems history. That's how we are. That's how we have come up. That's who we have come up to be is rebels. But rebels need to push against something. And the problem with being rebels is that sometimes we win. And when we win, we don't know what to do with the power. Rebels do not become nobles easily. Most of the ones who do started out noble, fell from grace, returned to nobility. Why is that important? Because until recently, there were two kinds of nobles from a peasant perspective. One kind grew up being taught about the responsibilities of nobility, and one was just taught about power and how to hoard it. It's a thing you learn from birth. And because we think of ourselves as the underdogs and rebels, we have failed to embody that. And I was going to say we have failed to teach it, but it's not true. Our children and youth do understand the responsibilities of nobility, even as they themselves are often cast as rebels, not just against the outside world, but against the UU establishment, and with good reason. Their rebellion is the insistence that we can and should take on the responsibility of nobility, that our power obligates us to do better than we do. But most of our children don't stick around because we have failed to give them an adult context that matches their values. They become rightly disillusioned with powerful people disclaiming their power and refusing to share it, refusing to take up the mantle of responsible nobility. So they left. They drift or move deliberately away. Our religious education programs, though, really do teach those values. They really do teach that if you have the power, you should be doing something good. 
I would argue that those people who come to Unitarian Universalism as adults often don't get that training. And the thing about that training is, it works differently when you already have power. When we understand ourselves as resistance, when we understand ourselves as rebels, we use one set of tactics and one set of approaches and one way of being in the world. And when we come to power, we have to keep our principles, our beliefs, our ideals intact. But our tactics have to change. Because we are no longer in the same position. We are no longer wielding the same tools and the same weapons. We've been upgraded. And we can do a great deal more damage in power than we can when we're rebelling. We can also face plant because there's nothing like having the thing you're pushing on suddenly removed from making you fall flat on your face. And we are routinely in danger of doing this. We find the thing we detest. We push on it with everything we've got. We underestimate our power to make it move, and then it gives way. And then what? Then we fall on our faces because we weren't prepared to win. We were not prepared to prevail, but we did. We didn't actually believe in ourselves, but now we are holding the power, and now is more important than ever. And now we have to be noble. It is more important than ever that we embody nobility. And how shall we do this? What does it mean? If we have power, we should be doing something good, and we should be doing something good within the structures that we now have access to, because winning means that we have access to the halls of power. Coming to power means that we then have access to the tools and structures of the systems that tend to be oppressive. We have access to the things that have hurt us potentially the most. And then the question becomes, what is the most effective thing that I can do in this moment with this power? Because this same system that hurt me has now vested me with the power to do something different, I think, which then gives us the freedom and the grace to make considered decisions with our humanness, considered decisions about what to keep and what to dismantle, about what to preserve and what to destroy. Big decisions. Scary decisions. My oldest friend and I were talking about triage the other day, triage and the pandemic and the decisions that doctors and other people are having to make about human lives in the moment and how humans are not at all suited to be making triage decisions, and yet here we are. But what we don't like to recognize is that there are so many other places where humans have that level of power over other humans and other things, and sometimes those humans who have that power are us. There are good reasons why we try to reject the power that we are often handed and even the power that we sought because it's too much. It's too much for any one human brain. We need help. And that is also the importance of nobility because it becomes a scaffolding. It becomes a guiding principle. It helps to prop us up in those heavy, weighty moments. We don't always know what the good thing is. We don't always know what the best thing is. We don't always know, but nobility tells us that we must try, that it is our job to try as flawed humans holding great power, and gives us a clue where we should aim. It is our job to try. It is not our job to abdicate that power. It is not our job to walk away from that power. It is not our job to put that power down and disappear. What is our job is to do the best job we can, to do well, to do good, to do kindness. That is our job. So first, our job is not to reject the power we have. Second, our job is to determine what is good. And our third job is to do that goodness, to enact that goodness. Our whole job is to be noble. So before any of this, our job is to seek power. Our job is to seek power and then to do good with it, to seek power, to acquire power, and then to use that power to enact goodness, to live out nobility. We have spent generations on the seeking power piece, and now we must spend some time on the having power piece, on the wielding power piece, on the doing better piece. The last thing I want to say about this is the last step in the process, to make sure that power does not make us evil. We can be heroes, or we can be villains, and power does not make us noble or evil, but power does give us the ability to enact much greater good or much greater evil. It means it makes a, more of a difference which one we do, and the best way for us as three-dimensional beings is to make the best choice we can in each slice of time, not, as Marge Piercy says, for always, but for a long time. And the best way for us to stay in goodness is to stay in community. You ever noticed that? 
villains have one or two henchmen and heroes have a whole community of people around them. It's heroes who have councils, King Arthur's Roundtable, Robin Hood's Merry Men. As you move into power, as you seek power, as you work for nobility and as you act, enact nobility in the world, you need a council. You must gather a council. Your council should be wise and strong and true and comfortable with power and noble, deeply committed to the idea that when you have power, you should be doing something good with it, and then you too can be noble. Go be noble. Seek power, find power, and use that power to do something good. Blessed be, and amen. So go out into the highways and byways, take your power, find your power, claim your power, and do some good with it. Even if only in this slice of time, do some good. Go in peace and go in love.